Welcome everyone to the uh, Foreman Community Demo. Uh, we got a number of items uh, for users to show off today. Uh, we'll jump right in with uh, Lukash, who's going to talk about uh, new options in uh, Discovery Image, and then talk about Pixelist Discovery updates. Over to you, Lukash. Okay, thanks. So I'm going to share my screen. Okay, you should see. You should see my window. <clears throat> and so first off, I'd like to show you, um, I'm not sure if you can, I'm going to click on hide. Can you, can you see the screen? You can. You can or you can't? Sorry, we can see it. Cool. I uh, just need to get rid of this Google Hangout window. How do I? Okay. So now finally you should see it uh, big in a big way. So first of all, I'd like to show you uh, progress of the uh, of the Pixie Linux feature, Pix Pixieless discovery feature. Uh, we have uh, this VM here, which is uh, actually a VM with a discovery image. Uh, Mount it as an ISO file, so you can uh, physically can mount it as a as a really uh, CD-ROM, DVD-ROM, or or a USB stick. It works works the same way as in uh, as with the boot disk plugin. It's an ISO hybrid, uh, you know, uh, ISO. And as you can see, uh, we have a text user interface which I should be able to interrupt uh, with a key. Uh, by default, it will attempt to do a standard discovery, which would uh, likely fail because we don't have uh, things like form and URL set and that kind of stuff. So with a key, I'm able to um, cancel, and now um, I can I can proceed to uh, Pixelus uh, discovery. So uh, the user interface present me with a list of uh, primary interface, a list of interfaces, uh, of all interfaces which are you know available in the, on the system, and those which are have link has a, this link up uh, tag. I'm able to select one, uh, and on the next screen um, I can. Uh, 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 set uh, IPv4 credentials, address, gateway, and DNS, because this interface was. Uh, this uh, was um, attempted to via uh, um, by DHCP. It all uh, it already you know prefills me some details, but I'm able, I'm able to uh, really change an IP address or or gateway and I want. And by clicking the next button, this network uh, interface will be reinitialized. On the next screen, I need to uh, type in the foreman URL. HTTP uh, doesn't really matter. Uh, yeah, any... Just wondering, I'm the only one, I'm not seeing the screens you're talking about. I'm still seeing the initial screen. Is that just me? or uh, It's Xavier oh. Rohat. Okay, so, so it looks okay. like you're not, you're not sharing. Uh, yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. And hopefully, sure. Okay. I'll just reset this instance again. So you should now see a booting instance. Uh, sorry about that. I have uh, multiple VMs running here. So uh, what we see here is the booting, a VM booting from ISO file, which is a, a new uh, build of a discovery image. Uh, it's not yet in uh, in the gits. It's in my. This is my own branch called TUI. Text user interface. If you want to check it out and build yourself, so now we are presented with a screen that you know tells you what what will happen in the next couple of screens. So uh, now I'm selecting the interface I want to uh, you know configure manually because uh, because we are we're, we're booting from an ISO. We don't have you know any information. The discovery ISO is works a different way than a boot disk, which is generated on the fly. The discovery image is you know handed over to you. To, to the users by formality, unchanged. So we need to really uh, select the interface. On the next screen, I am able to uh, configure the IP address and IPv4 credentials. Uh, again, this was 
because on my uh, because this interface um, uh, uh, is connected to the subnet with DHCP, it already initialized and presented me some options. But uh, if the, that was a subnet without DHCP, those values would be blank. Would be all blank. And this actually configures the uh, network interface in, in the background. Now, in this next step, I need to configure uh, for men, uh, credential credentials. So, HTTPS, for example, for men, some port. And I'm able to select if this is a server direct connection or via proxy. And on the next, uh, this last screen, I'm able to set three. This is just a prototype. Um, still working on this one. The, the last screen, uh, I'm able to provide some facts, custom facts, like uh, uh, I can do something like host group uh, DB server, and and the the plan is to you have uh, auto provisioning rule which triggers the correct uh, host group assignment and reboots this machine, actually k execs this machine. And once I click reboot, I'm taken to the discovery status uh, screen, uh, which would be, which is normally opened up if you're booting discovery. I saw the new version from, from, uh, from Pixie. And the last bit I'm still working on uh, this week and or next week would be uh, we want to k exec this instance uh, into the installer and carry on uh, with uh, installation. This is the last step I'm working on, which hasn't been implemented yet. The plan is to change the reboot uh, action, the reboot API command that is sent to a discovery image. Uh, it's using a um, shell on BMC provider uh, and extend it. Um, with kernel in it and append uh, input, so it, it will likely send a JSON body with kernel in it and append, uh, which is needed to do a proper k exec into the installer. So this is where we are. The, this was not a prototype. All the screens were actually working, except this little last one. I'm still working on the API, API change, uh, uh, and that's it. Uh, so this is the Pixelus discovery feature. This is, I would say, first cut, the first version. We, we've decided to do an easy uh, way via dis discovery um, uh, auto rules or discovery rules, which allows you some kind of flexibility um, uh, and can and for the, those who don't know, Pixelus Discovery aims to uh, uh, provide a workflow uh, for users uh, who, who do not run uh, who run the subnets without DHCP. So you, you're able to, uh, actually to discover host, and you're able to uh, you know initiate pro provisioning uh, manually with the discovery I saw mounted as a CD-ROM, DVD-ROM image or or USB stick. Are there any questions on the Pixelus, Pixelus discovery feature I'm working on? Uh, I don't see any yet, but they may come in over time. OK, cool. And um, uh, I'm going to reshare. Once again, to show you uh, very quickly, this is another instance, and this was booted from uh, Pixie, uh, from Pixie, and we have a new uh, new feature in the discovery image, which is a new FDI dot parameter called FDI dot uh, uh, Once we will be releasing new discovery image, hopefully next week, and this will be included. And it's a bigger change. Actually, what it does, uh, it um, uh, it um, it configures uh, by default. We want to configure only primary interface now. And if you if you provide FDI in it, net uh, equals all will uh, will configure all the interfaces uh, that are available on the system. We had uh, we had a race condition uh, bug in the image where if the all uh, inter interfaces were you know. Uh, 
uh, about to initialize the TFTP extensions and the zip extensions. We, that's the new feature of the latest uh, release of Discovery Image. We're not download, downloaded pro properly sometimes, so this patch fixes it and also introduces this, this flag. So if you really want to initialize all the interfaces, uh, all the secondary interfaces, so secondary by secondary we mean all the interfaces that, that uh, hasn't been you know, pixie booting from, or the image wasn't booted, pixie booting from, uh, you need to provide a, uh, the boot net or, or equals all. So I, this, this particular instance have this flag, so I'm going to head over to, to show you that all the interfaces are, have been initialized if, I, if I'm able to switch over to some UI. In the meantime, shoot your questions. Uh, I have one, one question. Um, so one of the purpose of having initializing all the other interfaces was that we can later on leverage those facts when we create the host already with the interfaces and in the right subnet or obviously with the right Mac. Is there a use case where the interfaces are disabled but we can detect I just don't know if they will be reported as interfaces, as facts. And if no, 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 no. No, no. Uh, okay. Yeah, we, we actually we actually fixed uh, the race conditions in, uh, in initializing, and I've decided to 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 set the initial only the primary interface as as the same default. But uh, your 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 point is right. Um, um, if that doesn't, you know, wor work well, um, we I can I can you know. Um, no, I'm just wondering if there's there is a way we can detect all interfaces that has a link and report on them, assuming you want if you patch the cable in the uh, you know patch the server in a way that already has a link, you probably want to use that network interface and later on use that information, or or potentially drive that. I mean, that's probably feature work if we ever want to do that to have an API to enable disable network, you know, or something uh, on, on the discovery image itself. I don't know if that's valuable or not. But I think the fact that we have now, that when we have uh, facts coming from discovery and those actually configure interfaces objects in, in, in Foreman, that's a good use case. Uh, and I wonder if we can keep that functionality with Nix and have a link. Yeah, I, I was... I was on the, on, on the impression that the factor still sends the MAC addresses uh, for the, all the interfaces on the system available on the system, and so um, I'm not that's sure the uh, what, yeah, what's the benefit. The yeah, what, what's the benefit? Yeah, so we, we, we should take this offline. Um, I'll send an email to the list, uh, and okay. if that proves as a not a good same default, uh, I can change it back. But anyway, we, we fixed uh, we fixed this, and, uh, and now as as you can see, Network Manager CLI sh uh, shows you the primary uh, uh, connection is always uh, named primary, and all the secondary uh, uh, connections are you know set up properly. And we are now using the native Network Manager uh, configuration uh, uh, syntax instead of uh, RH uh, CFG uh, the plugin. That's also nice. Uh, so that's a new feature of the development image. Okay. All right. Thank you, Lukash. Um, you moving on next to Tomash, we'll talk about some Hammer updates. Uh, hello. I've got three short updates for you today. Uh, let me share my terminal first. So now you should be able to see uh, my terminal. Uh, I've got two, uh, two updates regarding Hammer today. Uh, both of them are included on just or relatively recently released uh, Hammer 0.3. Uh, first of them is that we removed uh, pagination by default from the commands. So demonstrate that on uh, listing templates via Hammer. Uh, I do template list. You see that it's no longer uh, no longer split into pages. Uh, the option for uh, for splitting pages are still there, so I can still do 
custom pagination force uh, listing page I want. Uh, another uh, another feature is command, and it's command for uh, building uh, default Pixie menu for uh, TFTP servers, and it's equivalent to to the button that we know from the. It's equivalent to the build Pixie default button uh, from the UI as we know it. Uh, uh, j just a nitpick. It's not yeah. a. It's not a menu. I don't know if we should say menu. It's just a default configuration that could yeah. be a menu, but doesn't necessarily requires it. Yeah. Okay. Well, if I if I try to execute it, it will probably fail because I have some uh, some dummy uh, dummy proxies uh, on this testing instance. But normally it uh, it rebuilds uh, rebuilds the files. Uh, so that was all regarding Hammer. Uh, I will reshare to show my my browser. Uh, another update uh, I did is uh, on our deformen.org page, and it's in the documentation. Uh, we used to have uh, only one version of API online on the page. Uh, this week, I changed it to uh, to allow listing versioned APIs. So by default, when you go to documentation and uh, try to browse the API documentation, you get the uh, latest released, which is 1.8. And if I select some other version, you can see the title changed. And users can browse. Uh, API documentation for for that version. So that's it. Uh, it's supported up to 1.5 or 1.6, and uh, 1.5 below. Users need to uh, check their uh, live instances. So that's about it from my side. Any questions for that? Uh, just a quick no? quick question for the API update. Did we lose this the example? Request and response, or did we always miss them? Uh, I, re I think we, I didn't use it. Uh, I just regenerated. So it, the it, it, in the in the past, we had a way to use the testing fixtures data as the as samples for request and response. So it's you could see which it's there. Did I miss it? Or? Uh, it's still there, and there are still there should still be possibility to generate the documentation with these examples. I only didn't do it. Um, uh, if uh, if you executed the uh, tests with uh, that parameter on the required version, we would be able to display it uh, on that page too. It's just a matter, okay. matter of regenerating all the documentation again. So it's not there at the moment, but it should be available. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you, Tomash. Uh, now we'll go over to Avon, who's going to give some updates on the Foreman remote execution work. Hello, so uh, uh, let me s share my screen. Uh, you should see it now. Really? Uh, so, uh, I would like to give an update on uh, what happened since the last demo uh, where we showed the first steps of the formal remote execution. So, if anyone interested or haven't seen the design that we came up some uh, time ago, uh, please do so. Uh, it's in the GitHub formal remote execution uh, page or on the GitHub, uh, GitHub repo. We have the links there as well. So I would like to go uh, end -to -end, uh, through the end-to-end -end scenario that we got uh, so far. So in my uh, formal instance, I will increase the font a bit. So this will also test for the responsive design or not. Uh, we'll see. Uh, so I have uh, some templates prepared uh, for the job uh, execution itself. Uh, 
you probably seen this before. It's uh, the same UI as for the uh, provisioning templates or partition tables even. So uh, I'm I, here. I have the uh, template which is going to implement or run the ping command against uh, some domain, uh, and it will run it at the, at the on the host side. So uh, in the job, I specified that this is the uh, ping job. Uh, the reason for this is we support or plan to support multiple providers, and so you can have, let's say, yum install defined for SSH and uh, salt and Ansible and collective and whatever. So for every uh, provider, you would define a template, but they are grouped by this job because they do the same. And you can define the uh, template inputs. Nothing changed from the last demo here. So I define here that I want to input the domain, and it's uh, set as required. Uh, with format 1.10, and it, should, uh, it might get into 1.9 as well, you, can, you have also the preview button, uh, which doesn't work for some reason, but uh, I'll fix that. Uh, so it should work. So uh, I have the templates prepared, and now if I go uh, to the host page, uh, and go to some hosts. I have some uh, hosts which are, in fact, the Docker containers, and I run the test against them. So there is now the Run Job button at the Host Details page. Uh, and if I go there, I get into the Job Invocation uh, form. So uh, what I do here is I select what job I want to run. Uh, so in my case, I want to run the, the pink one. Uh, you can see that I have pre-filled the search query for what host uh, I want to run the command against. So uh, I will show later some more uh, examples. Now I will just use this one, this, and it's a standard uh, scoped search query. Uh, if I change the query, I can refresh it. I will show it later. The type of query me means, uh, especially for the uh, running in the future, if we want to evaluate the search score now and have the static list of hosts already, uh, or we want have a dynamic, uh, we want to have dynamic query, which means it will evaluate uh, once the execution starts, which might be at the midnight or next week or whatever. So I will use static uh, query here. Uh, you can see that I have the provider SSH here. This is the only template I have right now. We could even have more templates for the same provider. And uh, I can input the uh, domain here. Uh, and I will try to run it now. So uh, what it does, it starts a dynafold task. Uh, this is a bulk one, which composes uh, of uh, several subtasks. And uh, for this uh, one host case, we'll probably not use this bulk task, but for the time being, uh, we have it there. And if I go to the details, uh, I can see the details of the out basically most important thing, the output and the status. So uh, because that's just to uh, not overlap, we, we have fixed things fixed from the UI part. Uh, so this is the case for uh, running from uh, host details. Uh, more interesting thing is probably doing so from the host index page, where what you can do, you can select a couple of hosts and choose the run job from the uh, bulk actions menu, and it will show me the page for uh, running this host. So you can see that the search query now is composed of the, all the hosts that are that I have selected. Uh, again, I can do the same and run it now. Okay, I have some issues here, but uh, that's uh, let's let's try something else. That's what I like about live demos. Uh, let's try this. Again, uh, 
Okay, so uh, I've used search scope uh, to select the host, and I should start seeing uh, that 10 tasks were scheduled, three already succeeded, nothing failed. This is the standard form and task page, so uh, no fancy UI yet, but we'll get there as well. And I can browse again through the subtask uh, uh, on the pair host basis. Now what I will try, I will go again uh, back to uh, uh, the uh, again. And I will uh, stop one of the hosts. So let's see what happens if uh, some host is not up. For the Docker. OK. Uh, so again, let's try it. I have, again, 10 tasks, and at the next refresh, I expect one task to fail. Yeah, let's get there. So we have stopped with result war warning. If I go to details, right now, we have the data about what host was uh, run this task against. We don't show that yet, but uh, this will get fixed. So you can see uh, the reason why this failed. So we can compute the status of the, of the task in general. So you can see the results. So another thing that we added is ability to schedule the task for the future. Uh, so again, if I go to the uh, host page, I will do that for one host for now. So if I go to the run job, and again, I will select what job I want to run, I can uh, set the time of the execution to the future. So let's make it in one minute. And we added the support for the future execution into Dynflow itself. So you can see that this task is scheduled to be run in a minute. Uh, so. Uh, until it starts, we can look into something else. So nothing fancy yet. Uh, in the meantime, I can talk about uh, how the uh, verification on the form and proxy or the communication with the form and proxy works. So if I, uh, when I run the job, it doesn't contact the host directly, but it contacts the smart proxy. The selection of the smart proxy, the algorithm is not there yet. There are multiple ways. Uh, that we could choose, and you can expect some email uh, for more input about that. So right now, this is hard-coded. Uh, but the important thing is when the uh, command is sent to the smart proxy, we are running the, uh, the Dynflow console there as well. And it's uh, running the commands itself. Once the commands is finished, the proxy sends back to the form and the results uh, of this. Uh, so the proxy is the one to access the SSH, and the easiest way how to uh, get to the public key of the of the proxy that is configurable is getting that directly from the uh, public API of the SSH provider. So you can basically take this file, uh, save it into the uh, authorized keys, and the host should be manageable. Uh, also, uh, we uh, support on the proxy verification of the host. So if you know the public key of the host or you can get it uh, through the public facts, uh, it will use these keys to verify the host. Uh, okay, so let's see in the mean meantime if the execution started. Yeah, so you can see now that from the scheduled, uh, even in the execution history, we scheduled that at 13.35 and then 13.36. Uh, it started and uh, in five seconds later, it finished. Uh, here is the uh, output of the uh, detailed task. 
I, I can go to the Dynaflow console uh, and see the raw data that we collect, and we can use more so we can see that at the each uh, line uh, that we got from the uh, input, we get uh, if it was standard out or standard error, we get this timestamp and um, at the end exit status. Uh, another thing that I would like to show is ability to cancel the tasks. Uh, so let's uh, tweak the job template a bit. Uh, and we will not specify the, the count number for the ping, so uh, it should uh, ping forever, which is what we want to uh, uh, simulate right now. So again, I will go to the run job. Uh, let's run it now. I can go to the uh, running steps. So uh, the command is running on the foreign proxy. I can send the cancel event there. And so what happened or should happen is the event gets to the foreign proxy, and the foreign proxy handles uh, or should handle the canceling itself, and the command should be killed. Uh, I haven't tested these before the demo, so. Uh, I'm not sure if uh, this will work right now or not. So uh, uh, we have this as a surprise. Okay, so still haven't uh, happened. Let's try to, to cancel it from here. And there might there are several things that might get broken. I haven't also tested it against the uh, Docker container, so there might be some issue in there. So I will investigate it later. So right now, I will just kill the uh, proxy. Uh, so, and that's probably it what uh, I have to show right now. Um, are there any questions? I have a question. Um, just wondering, can you show again the metadata you're collecting from any from any job? Uh, yes, yeah, so let's get to the tasks. So one, one of the things uh, I was thinking, or I mean, I know system D has a very elaborated uh, meta definition. For example, even, even obvious things like the, you know, the UID and PID and GID and what command was actually executed and maybe even the the C group you are in, or other things like that. Um, just wondering if it makes sense for us to capture uh, additional information, you know, more information that can. Uh, yeah, so we right now capture just just the uh, output that is produced by by the uh, script itself. Another thing that we probably will uh, capture here is the public key that was used for the SSH, and the reason for that is. Uh, the case when you want you don't have the public key at the beginning, but you want to be in uh, in the state where you let's say trust the first call to the uh, host, and then use this key that was used at the beginning to verify the next steps. So uh, we haven't thought about uh, collecting more data until we we have the uh, mechanism to to do something with that. Okay. Thank you. And, and I assume, as a follow-up, I assume we have later on some standardized way to produce, to add metadata, or you know, to actually give us some additional indications, or or it will all be, be always be based on the exit status or parsing the output. Uh, that's. Uh, uh, up on us what we decide to to do with the data later. So right now we have the data uh, that we can show in the task uh, output itself that we can process. But uh, we assume for 
more structured things and being able to search for uh, uh, the data. Uh, ideally, we would like to extract or, uh, this to some reports. Uh, so, uh, ideally, you're using the reporting that we have right now to extract the data from the, the commands. And this means if we add additional data that we uh, can extract, we can uh, extract that from the output that we collected at the beginning. So, the idea is collecting in the task output itself the raw data that we got uh, uh, as much as possible at the moment of the execution and then running some additional processing on this output. And this means if we add some uh, something like that, we can process the raw data to extract it, uh, the extract this information. As we're running short on time, um, yep. can you uh, quickly show the task cleanup? Um, so yeah. Get, so I, I will fo follow uh, uh, this. So uh, you can imagine running the uh, bulk tasks and uh, doing so periodically, as well as importing the host uh, host facts that uh, we put upstream. Uh, you can get uh, many tasks in your system. So uh, another thing that we added to the foreman tasks is ability to configure and uh, run uh, the cleanups uh, of these tasks. So th there's a rake task, foreman task cleanup. Uh, in, it's configurable. Uh, also, some actions uh, such as fact imports define uh, the uh, expiration time uh, so that uh, it, by default it would get cleaned uh, after 30 days. You, you should be able to see this if, when I run the config uh, task, which will show me the, def uh, the current uh, configuration of the, uh, of the cleanup script. Um, sorry for uh, this taking a while. It loads the, loads the uh, Rails environment. So uh, you can see that after 30 days, it would uh, delete the import facts. Uh, so uh, as I mentioned, it's configurable. So in the configuration file for the format tasks, you can uh, define the global uh, uh, period. So all the tasks would be deleted after one year. Uh, uh, by default, this is not set. And what I will do is uh, setting the job run uh, task that uh, I've I just produced, and I will set them to be cleaned after one hour. So uh, when I would run it uh, again, I would I would see another task getting cleaned after one hour. So another uh, useful uh, option is the no uh, uh, flag, which will show me how many tasks would get cleaned at this moment for a given configuration. Uh, and uh, if it uh, once it finishes, it should show me how many it will be. You can see and find more uh, options on how it works in the README for the foreman tasks. Uh, there is also a mode where you don't have to rely on the configuration itself, but you can specify the uh, scope search, specifying the uh, task that you want to clean, and it, it would uh, one. Uh, it would be one time thing. The, the uh, also the format of the time and so on. <laughs> so you can uh, see more details there. And uh, now uh, it says that it would delete the host import facts. I uh, because I uh, have to forget to do something like saving or. Uh, Oh, it is. I just uh, haven't seen. So it would run the deletion for the job run and then the import fact. So the job run would get 42 tasks, uh, clean it, and zero task for uh, the other action. The 42 is accident here, but it's good. So once I clean it up, uh, when I go to the task page, uh, See if I have here the, the previous uh, page. Oh. So I, I have this here: ten pages of the tasks. After this finishes, uh, well, I should get a bit 
uh, OS. But we don't, want, don't, don't need to wait for this to finish. So uh, that's uh, what I wanted to show you. Uh, and yeah, instead of 10, we have eight pages. So 42 tasks uh, disappeared somewhere in the universe. So that's really it from me. Any questions for this part? Um, one just sort of quick question. Uh, you don't have to go into over too much detail, but um, is there has there been any talk or thought towards be either uh, sort of audit trailing ones that you delete or archiving ones that uh, you want to clean up instead of just completely blowing them away? Yeah. So uh, we were thinking about that. Uh, we just didn't have uh, time for the implementation. So. Uh, yeah, that would definitely be something uh, valuable to be able to export the task and, and store it or extract just the uh, interesting details. Uh, so yeah, there is space for improvement, but uh, this is mainly for the task imports uh, or facts imports where people usually don't care about uh, the this uh, at all because the data are imported into something else as well. So uh, for this async, when you use the dime flow and form a task for uh, async operations, this is uh, really useful. All right. Thank, Thank you. you for the question. Uh, all right. We'll move over to Stephen to show off the discovered host status dashboard. Hi. Uh, so I'm going to show you just a small change we made to the discovery widget. Um, before, the discovery widget uh, was about one longer than what you see on the screen, so it was a bit difficult to put other widgets next to it. Um, so we made it smaller, and we also added this little indicator here to give you an idea um, when new discovered hosts show up in the UI. Um, so there's three indicators. Uh, the host is new in the last 24 hours, uh, a host that we haven't heard from in a while, and a host that's reported recently. These are also sorted by the time that they were created. Um, so we also added the same to the discovered hosts list. Um, so it kind of helps you find out uh, which machines are new and which ones aren't. That's it. Excellent. Thank you, Stephen. All right, we'll move over to Tomer to talk about uh, a preview of uh, UI changes related to parameters. Okay, so I'm going to show you actually a couple of changes. Uh, one of them uh, that was made by uh, mostly by Ori uh, has to do with the puppet class uh, screen, where the smart class parameters, uh, this is what they used to look like, like a really long form, lots of options, and uh, if you had multiple matches, it could get very confusing very easily. And uh, this is what it's going to look like soon. Um, we grouped the form into subforms. Uh, the validators is now a, a collapsible part because you don't need it most of the time. Uh, so you can just hide it. And the matchers are, uh, they have select options. And if you, for example, uh, Add an environment, the drop-downs update, and you can just enter whatever values you need. So this is one change that's uh, very close to getting merged, hopefully within the next week. Another change that was uh, made mostly by Tom has to do with the viewing all the parameters in hosts or host groups. Uh, so this is what it looks like right now. Uh, a lot of various parameters, really hard to understand what's a global parameter, what's a pop parameter, what overrides what. Um, and this is the prototype of uh, what it's going to look like. So if you want to, for example, override a service-enabled parameter, just click override, set it to true. Uh, later, you change your mind. You want to undo the override, just remove it. Uh, you can. Um, 
check use puppet default. The parameters are grouped by a puppet class or global parameters. This part still isn't done yet, but it will look very similar to this. Um, that's it. Any questions? All right. Thank you, Tomer. Thank you. Next up, we will have uh, Shim throwing off the new inherit button. Okay, let me share on the screen. Hopefully, you can see it. Um, okay, uh, till recently, we were using a blank value in fields like Puppet environment and like that to indicate that the fields uh, should be copied uh, from the host group, but we got a requirement change that a black blank value is valid. So we are no longer able to use the nil or blank value as an indicator. So uh, as a solution, I've added a button, the inherit button, to the uh, to the field. So uh, in this button will indicate that the value should be copied. Uh, I have not changed the copy on demand behavior, which means once the value is copied, it will not trace the changes on the host group itself. The value, once it's copied, is there on the host. So if you want it to be changed, you should change your host. Uh, let me show you how it works. You just select the host group, and it gets the values from the host group right immediately. Um, the same goes for already created hosts and stuff like that. That's all. You can, at any moment, you can uncheck the button and select something else. It's valid. OK, that's all. All right. Thank you. Uh, I don't see any questions on the Q&A app, so we'll uh, end the demo there. Thank you to all of our uh, presenters. Um, we'll do this again in three weeks. That's all. Thanks. <laughs>